Hello, welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks program for 2022. This is part one in the Integrated EV Solutions Digital Festival starting today, continuing tomorrow and the day after. Our topic for the hour is installing EV charging points at your building in our session sponsored by Mer. The chair for the next 60 minutes, my name is Jim McClelland. I'm founder and editor of SusMeme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this sunny afternoon are Dr. Darren Handley, Head of Infrastructure Grants, OZEV, Department for Transport, Shamla Evans Gadgill, Senior Program Project Manager at Coventry City Council, Melanie Shufflebotham, co founder at COO Zap Bap, and Alex, Hin Alex Hinchcliffe, Interim MD at Murr. It is all live, as you can tell. Q&A to finish, pop your questions in the appropriately named Ask a Question box. You'll probably see at the bottom of your screen, roughly in the middle. You pose them, I'll ask them, they'll answer them. So a bit about Elemental. This webinar forms part of a program of talks hosted and produced by Elemental, elementalexpo.com. For those who don't know, it's the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air, and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. Please note, Elemental is a CPD member, so the good news is means the webinars are CPD accredited. You'll find a full diary of events on the website, range of upcoming webinars, in particular the other two sessions in this festival. Tomorrow we have innovative EV charging options at 2 p.m. an hour earlier, and the future of EV charging is a case study from Portsmouth City Council on Thursday, an hour earlier again at 1 p.m. So check those out if you can. There's also a back catalog, host of hot topics, all available on demand, who's who, great speakers, and everything is free to access, I should add. So, by way of a very brief intro from me, because we've got a lot to cover, electric vehicles, EVs, figures from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, SMMT, helpfully reproduced, I hasten to add, on ZapMap's own website, show there are now over 530,000 battery electric cars on UK roads and a further 405,000 plug-in hybrids. Uptake, as we all know, is boosted in part by the announcement made in November 2020 by UK government alongside its 10-point plan for the Green Industrial Revolution that there'll be a ban on all sales of new and petrol and diesel cars by 2030. However, not only to service existing uses but support the growing market, the scale and speed of decarbonisation depends not just on those vehicles but, of course, the charging infrastructure. And when it comes to charge points, it's how many there are, where they are, is critical. Hence, the first talk in our Solutions Digital Festival will discuss the opportunities and challenges around installing EV charging points at your building. Why? Well, because people working at, visiting businesses, increasingly expect there to be facilities for EV charging. So we're going to look at practical advice and where to get started, how to fund the setup and installation, but also consider some of the issues around the more difficult property scenarios where access is complicated or occupancy mixed. So that's enough from me. Let the debate begin. Right. As we start to explore how building owners currently do and ideally should approach the integration of EV charge points from investing to installing, I'm going to ask our panel to introduce themselves, explain their perspective, share some opening insights. So briefly, it's going to be who are you? Where do you fit into the puzzle? What's the state of play on EV charge point installations in the UK right now? So first up, kick us off. View from the government office, perspective on the transition to ZEVs, ZEVs, and charge point rollout. Darren, your opening thoughts, please. Um, so as government, we set out our perspective in March in uh, EV infrastructure strategy, good read. Um, so there's lots and lots of figures quoted for what may be needed by 2030. Uh, we've gone for a figure of about 300,000 public charge points, but I think the main thing to take home is that we think the vast majority of charging events actually will be done at home. It's the most easy place. And it'd be revolutionary for petrol drivers to not have to go to a forecourt to fill up their car, um, which is the main reason why people will want to charge at home, cheaper, more convenient. So that's really taken off with the sales of EVs. We're still on that journey to 2030. I think it's fair to say. Uh, lots of bumps coming along the way. So for public charging, we know there's work to do to make sure it's as easy as it should be for people to find those charge points, that they work when you get there, that you know how much it will cost, and you can use any one 
you don't have to wait two weeks to sign up to some thing to be able to use that charge point. Um, so we've got lots of work going on. Um, also new builds, you're probably aware that this year the government put in changes to building regulations. So all new builds in England need to have charge points, um, which is great. And we're looking at car parks. The Scottish government is doing similar up in Scotland. Um, so we're definitely on the way. Um, we're keeping pace with the uptake of EVs. Uh, and there's lots of work to do. And the market itself is going to change as we get more electric vehicles. The amount of government support you're seeing will decrease. Um, I think it's fair to say as EVs become mainstream, um, if they're everywhere, then the incentive for commerce to actually provide those public charge points becomes ever better business case. Um, and it gets easier and simpler for people to put in those charge points at home. The current, some of the current hurdles to see should be overcome, which is kind of where government is at the minute, is trying to help overcome the hurdles. Excellent, thank you. Great intro. So, strategy, good to hear there is one, of course. 300,000 is the kind of number you're looking at. Uh, you're expecting most, and um, when you say home, I'm assuming you mean literally at their residence, not at work. You mean? Well, actually, so primarily people want to charge at home. Obviously, being able to charge at work helps um either people who are commuting a long distance um or those people who find it difficult to find charge at home it gives another option sure um, so i will expect that most workplaces will have the ability for their staff to charge evs and obviously their fleets will transition we're seeing all, all major fleets Excellent. having a plan to transition to electric vehicles Good, thank you. And you mentioned the building regs, the mandating, and you also described effectively that government is still in pump priming mode, if you like, and there will be a taper off as kind of uh, take up uh, happens in the commercial sector, uh, as we have seen previously with other perhaps um, renewable technologies, for example. Um, so Shamala, when it comes to infrastructure, property, demographics, no two towns or cities are the same, obviously. So Talk to us, what's the scenario in Coventry at present? Yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, um, I'm, I'll just take uh, on from where Darren's left, really. Um, so in Coventry, um, you know, we have uh, just over 46% of properties that don't have off-street parking facility. So which sort of makes it quite challenging uh, for them to have that, um, uh, you know, confidence uh, mm -hmm. in purchasing uh, electric vehicles. So... Uh, as a uh, highway authority, um, we have tapped into the government funding that is made available uh, to install on-street charges uh, in those streets where off-street parking is not available. So uh, there is a, a program which is on-street uh, residential charge point scheme um, and only local authorities can apply for it. So we have done so. Um, we have provided now about uh, just over 500 charge points. Uh, we are still ongoing. Uh, you can actually see all of those on that map. Um, and uh, of course, <coughs> another bit with Coventry is the uh, SMEs. You know, there are, uh, and, and the fact that Coventry is a student city as well, you know, with the Coventry University and Warwick University as well. So there are a lot of HMOs. Um, so again, you are trying to provide charging infrastructure for them as well, because once mm -hmm. they, and they do tend to have cars. I mean, one of the things we do want to do is see car um, sort of ownership decreasing. So I think working around this, but providing this uh, supporting infrastructure for electric vehicles, um, you know, looking at demography, as you said. Uh, so providing for those who don't, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit challenging to access these charge points. That's what currently Coventry is embarked on. Excellent, thanks. And uh, yeah, telling figure there, so 46%, almost one in two, basically, don't have off-street parking. So you can immediately see the need for public or on-street or other alternatives. But interesting, and you have about 500 in play already. Interesting point you made there in the sense that we do not want cars to be dominating all areas of the town or city. And there are many moves, obviously, to moderate car usage and access. So there are, there are some uh, conflicting drivers 
pun intended, in play perhaps. So nice, nice couple of points there. So now, Melanie, so when it comes to putting charging on the map, literally, where is the UK in terms of public and private charge points nationwide, please? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Melanie Shuttlebotham. I'm, I'm the co-founder of ZapMap. And for those of you who don't know, ZapMap is a map of electric car charging, public electric car charging points. We aggregate all the charging points all into one place. And really, our, our prime aim is to help EV drivers when they're out and about to find charge points, plan their journeys and, and pay for charging. In terms of where we are at the moment, the, the top, top line figures are that we have a roughly or almost 35,000 devices, so charge points, sort of units, if you like, across around 20, 22,000 locations across the UK, which is great. And that's up about 35% from this time last year. So the, the charge point network is, is rolling out at quite a pace along, alongside the, the growth in EV drivers. I think the important thing uh, to say from my perspective is, is that not all charging is created created equal so mm -hmm. there are different types of charging and different use cases so we, we heard about the need for on-street charging where where people don't have off-street parking there's also which is typically a uh, low powered uh, five kilowatt or seven kilowatt watt units and then there is the a, a totally different use cases when you're on a longer journey you need rapid or ultra rapid chargers so as fast as possible they need to be reliable you need to just go in get out charge up as as soon as possible and then in the middle there is is, is something we, we term as destination charging which is really about having a charge point wherever you might stop for for one or two hours um either topping up uh, or actually at your destination so so at a hotel or an attraction or topping up at a supermarket or, or a car park and um, so in terms of the breakdown of the charge points that we have at the moment around 6,000 of those 36,000 are these on, on, on route rapid or ultra rapid chargers. Around 6,000 or so are these on street chargers, so maybe in lampposts, but just to support the, those people who don't have off street parking. And in the middle, there's around 20,000 sort of broadly mm. destination chargers at supermarkets, car parks, etc. So it's, it's quite a, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting landscape at the moment. And there's, there's no question that there's a lot of opportunity out there for for um, property, or, you know, I know that charge point networks want to find properties to install charge points because the number of EV drivers is growing exponential, very fast, and and the charge points are also growing fast, and it needs to continue to do do so to get towards that that three hundred thousand or so public charge points of all the different flavors that are needed by twenty thirty. Excellent, thanks. And uh, so, with total line figures thirty five thousand units, roughly twenty two thousand locations. Interesting that, of course, we need to bear in mind those two different figures. As you said, rolling out pace, not all created equal variety. So, ultra fast destination, etc. And I think I might uh, take exception and just take one question now because I think kind of it's probably one for you, actually, Melanie. In that, uh, Derek Beer has asked exactly how many installed to date and what is the rollout plan? I think you've kind of answered what's installed, but could you just give us a flavor of the pace of rollout? What kind of numbers you think you're seeing or how fast? I wonder yeah, if you I could mean, add I mean, a comment, please. Plan's really interesting. So in terms of the rapid and ultra rapid networks without on route charging and, and a lot of the destination charge, that's very much uh, driven by commercial, commercial companies. So they have, uh, business models they have lots of investment I mean e almost every week you hear about uh, a charge point operator getting millions of pounds of investment in order to roll out this uh, typically high high speed ultra rapid charging so in terms of the exact rollout plan it's difficult to determine but I know they're going as fast as they can and then I guess at the other end it's more on, on the local authorities plan and, and that's at a, at a local authority by local authority level that they need to understand what the needs are of their of their population and work out who they work with to deliver to deliver those charge points. Excellent, thanks. And then first in this first round, coming to you now, Alex. So, of course, this isn't happening in a vacuum. So, in the context of net zero targets and goals, because of course it's part of that bigger picture, how can solutions providers such as yourselves help building owners and landlords in the UK, Alex? And you're still on mute, I'm afraid. <laughs> Brilliant Fantastic. start, just to try and stop the background noise, but hopefully we're in exactly. now. Um, so following on from, from the other speakers, really, um, I'm Alex Hinchcliffe. I uh, look after mayor charging um, and, and driving the, the, the new sales with commercial landowners in the UK. Um, mayor for Context is a, uh, a major European CPO that has 10,000 uh, charging sockets across 
five uh, Northern European countries and um, we've been building a public facing network in the UK for the last couple of years. Um, we're up to about 500 owned and operated publicly facing sockets at the moment. We've got at least the same again, contracted or under construction. Um, so I'd say we're, we're in a pretty good position to understand the market in terms of what, what we can bring in terms of benefits to, to landowners. Um, we operate right across the scale of what's been mentioned already. Um, certainly we've done a major project in, in Durham uh, called uh, Scaling On-Street Charging Infrastructure, SOSCI. Um, so we support um, local authorities and councils with, with uh, enabling the, the transition, but our, our primary focus, uh, as Melanie suggested, is in and around destination and mostly actually en route or pit stop charging. Uh, and we're looking for commercial landowners with roadside retail or retail destinations where we can build mostly rapid and ultra rapid infrastructure. Uh, which is what our customers, what our publics are telling us that they want more of. Um, so I think, you know, especially when it comes to new builds or uh, planning conditions, building regulations, uh, expansions, new developments, we can support businesses to uh, meet their legislative requirements from government in terms of fulfilling those criteria. And we can do that uh, through funded solutions or from supporting the customer with a full turnkey solution depending really on what their appetite for investment and ownership is, our preference would be to take a lease on, on their demise um, and to operate on their behalf as a fully managed service and, and offer them a, a truly passive income for, for really not, not doing anything other than opening up their land to facilitate services for EV drivers. And I think as well as generating that new revenue stream, which is obviously fundamentally important, um, there's a cost of living crisis at the moment, there's issues around retail, if we can drive new footfall into environments where there are amenities, retail, uh, and rejuvenate some of that retail spend on the high street in retail environments, um, then not only do we satisfy um, the tenants on the landlord's properties, but we also provide a solution and opportunity to drive that footfall in, but give them an independent revenue as well. So it's a combination of service provision, rejuvenating retail, supporting landlord, landlords, it's a little bit of an un unknown area for, for, for many uh, of the landowners. Quite a lot of the big portfolio owners have already made a commitment, but there's a there's a huge untapped market and, and they really ought to be looking at um, making some uh, movement in that, that space at the moment. Excellent, thank you. And, and that just gives a flavor of how much it's still very much an emerging and evolving market, if you like, as you say. So Mayor, very much looking at destination or pit stop charging opportunities. Uh, helping meet legislative requirements, a range of options in terms of contractual and funding scenarios, and some on street. So it just gives a yeah a taste of um, yeah really what kind of solutions are available and are coming available. So that's the round of intros. This middle bit this is the fun bit for me, kind of because I get challenges and conflicts. So obviously the reason we have these kinds of discussions is because we're still on a journey. As Darren said, there is a way to go. There are, will be some bumps in the road. There are some challenges and difficulties. So I'd like to get into some of that in this middle section. Zoom in on specifics, challenge the panel, look at the barriers to the rollout, the difficulties, the shortfalls, all the tricky stuff. What's the problem, is it? Policy, tech, skills, or even just cost? What needs to happen to get that infrastructure in place faster and further? So starting with you, Shamla, first. So obviously we're discussing EVs and charge points today, but it doesn't happen in isolation. There's planning, transport policy, residential retail, commercial development, air quality utilities, never mind local politics, the list goes on. So how can a local authority such as yours decide its priorities for EVs and at the same time hope to manage the expectations of all those different stakeholders involved? Yes, I mean, uh, you are, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I would say with the local authorities, I mean, you know, that I, I think uh, up to now, transport and energy were two different things and suddenly yeah. you put both, both of them together now and you're expecting local authorities to have that skill set to go and deliver something that is completely foreign to either uh, of the of the industry if you like or sector so i i would say the local authorities really need to start with a strategy you know need to understand what is their demography because like, for example, in Coventry, what we've done, yes, you can 
take the process and scale it up somewhere else. But the way it is done, you won't be able to lift that model and just put it in another um, uh, location. You do need to understand the demographics. You know, like having a lot of students in Coventry is not the same as say, if you went to Blackpool or Brighton on Hull, they are, they are very much uh, sort of like a tourist um, uh, location. So mm -hmm. understanding who, what the services your city or borough, parish, hamlet, whatever it is, provides and to who, who is your audience. So understanding that and then looking at where is the, 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 the longest dwell time it's all of these. So what, what is the challenge? It's skill set, I would say, primarily. Um, there needs to, that, that this awareness, you know, and I know that the government is doing a, a lot around this, especially when, uh, you know, with this um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure strategy, uh, there is a element of funding that is uh, made available for resource. However, you need to have that resource, you know, that is not currently there as yet. So, so that is that I would say that is the biggest challenge uh, within the local authorities. Uh, right now, you know, this job, if you like, falls on whatever that authority understands that EV sits under. So it depends who actually gets that um, mandate in an authority. You know, if they think, oh, we need to have this, it's supposed to be on the street. So it goes to transport planner or it will go to... Mm -hmm. They've heard about lighting column charges, so it goes to street lighting. Yeah, so that yeah. kind of, it's still going on, it's still prevalent. Uh, there are uh, organizations like Energy Saving Trust, Senex, OZEV have set up a support body system. It's making the local authorities aware of what is available for them to tap into, to create that skill set. You know, that, that is the primarily, that is the main main element there because i know charge point operators there are some uh, exceptionally good charge point operators but at the end of the day the um, uh, you know from a procurement perspective and also from a planning perspective um as as they say for example a highway authority you need there are certain legislations that are there and charge point operators don't necessarily know what they are so a local authority does need to understand these things so from a Challenge perspective, I would say strategy needs to be there. Demography, they need to understand, look at the inside team, work with them, um, and then decide what capacity charges are needed where. But that is so very important. You know, where you actually um, uh, install these charges will make a success or a not successful uh, touch point installation, you know. Very important. All these small elements, you know, that sort of makes up the whole. Uh, but you need to understand uh, it, the considerations, what needs to uh, be there to decide what that um, strategy needs to be. But So basically, it's all about serving your constituents. So understanding, getting that buy-in from uh, members, you know, because most of the local authorities, you need uh, these certain approvals. Mm -hmm. So... Yep. Getting, getting that right uh, right note. Yeah, re really nice explanation of uh, the challenges there. As you said at the top, fundamentally, strategy, it's a strategic question. Yeah. Nice point about the need for ownership. If it falls between departments and different responsibilities, somebody's got to actually pick up the job. Skill set then comes into play. It might be skill set that needs support. Um, from external parties or from others within. And then you made some good points about capacity. And I like the way you talked about uh, it being a success, but tried to avoid the word failure or not a success. So success or not a success. Yeah, that's that's the, that's the two scenarios that potentially faces. So a nice explanation of what we're looking at. So similarly, coming to you then, Alex. So we've got residential to workplace, leisure, retail, private vehicles, fleets, some garages, off-road parking, wall-mounted, floor standing. There are about as many permutations as there are cars, vans and lorries. No one-size-fits-all scenario. So which are the hardest to install at present and why? Is it tech, planning, price? What are the really difficult ones at the minute, Alex? Hopefully I'm not on mute this time again. Um, no, so... The all of the above, really, Jim. Um, 
there's, 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 there's barriers and bottlenecks and, and, and limiting factors uh, at every turn, which makes it a, a difficult market to, to develop in. Um, I think our publics are demanding high powered ultra rapid charging um, and in abundance as well. I think it was touched on earlier. I can't remember who mentioned it, but I think we're, we're moving away from range anxiety with a number of charge points now available. And there's a big shift towards mm -hmm. uh, reliability and availability anxiety. There needs to be good quality working products uh, with little or no queuing when you arrive at these locations. So we're looking to build out uh, multiple bay hubs of rapid and ultra rapid charging. And with that comes the requirement for a landowner partner that's prepared to give up that amount of land, um, which can be challenging in the first instance, but then we need to make sure that there is sufficiently available power in, in abundance to be able to uh, charge those the infrastructure at the right level to deliver what the consumer would be expecting. Um, that is probably the, the biggest issue. Um, the cost of those grid services, the speed with which we can get to market is massive as well. Um, clearly there are supply chain challenges for everybody today. Certainly the manufacturers of charging infrastructure, the demand is massive across the globe really, but certainly in a European context, the lead times for hardware is being pushed out and pushed out. Um, materials for components is being uh, in increasingly scarce and difficult to find. So, and then we've got, as you mentioned, issues around planning or uh, legalities, uh, making sure we've got access rights, easements, way leaves to put um, substations and cabling in the ground. Um, sometimes you'll find that if the power is significant distance away from the charging infrastructure, you'll have to go across third party land um, and you can, uh, encounter things like what we call a ransom strip where there's another landowner that we have to dig across to be able to get the infrastructure in and the bigger the charging site the more chance of that happening um so yeah really i would say these these ultra rapid hubs are the way forward but also the most challenging to get into the ground um and then potentially you know within the context of that i would say Petrol forecourts is probably the most difficult environment because of the, the hazardous nature of that. They're looking to go ultra rapid. They're looking to transition, have a mixture of traditional um, combustion engine fuels and also move into electrification. And that's a really, really difficult space to navigate. Um, and those landowners, especially the independents, don't know whether to go down a funded route, whether to buy it themselves, whether the time is right. So I would say that is the biggest uh, challenging area at the moment. But so rapid and ultra rapid, yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. So four court owners, as you say, that brings in the question of uh, landowner partners and permissions if they're independent, for example. Um, of course, there's consumer expectation and cost. But as you pointed out, speed of delivery uh, is part of the equation. And there's an implication that supply chain issues, as with any growing technology market, if you like, uh, globalization supply chain post COVID, also with the conflict in Ukraine. Um, is not straightforward and is potentially a challenge. So if I come to you, Melanie, and so around charge point anxiety, we hear still EV users and potential buyers talking about it. And obviously you've got an app for that, Zap Map, 95% public charge point maps, 70% live availability. So the info is available. So why are some drivers still nervous? And what does that mean, in your opinion, for the likes of building owners and landlords in terms of benefits for investing in some on-site provision. So is there still anxiety? And if so, why and what can building owners do about it to help? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, if, if you look in the, in the big picture, this is a massive transition. So we're shifting from mobility patterns that people are really familiar with. They have a petrol or diesel car, they go to the local service station, they fill up and you know they, they go on their journey and, and, and that's that. And we are shifting to a whole new world of mobility in, in many ways is easier because you charge up at home and you don't even need to use the public charging except maybe in 20% in, in of, of cases, although of course the issue of no on street off street parking. But you know it, it's a it's a shift in mindset. People need to start thinking about kilowatt hours instead of miles per gallon. They need to be thinking about CCS and Chadamo and that, that's a challenge for people so it, it, it is a scary transition and so to me education research information communication all of that is is, in, is incredibly important when you actually and, and, and i think that there is a certain 
a portion of the press who are very keen to focus on on negatives. People love a negative story yeah, about yeah. queuing at a charge point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When we actually survey our, our EV drivers, ninety. Uh, 90- 8% of them say they would not go back to a petrol or diesel car. Mm-hmm. That's not to say there's not challenges. There, there certainly are as we, as we roll out a, a, um, any new technology. And there certainly are reports of people, <clears throat> A, not being able to find a charger where they want it or it, it not, be, not being working. And so some of that is around the availability of data and, mm-hmm. and the fact mm-hmm. that we're now uh, moving through into this sort of next stage. There's a number of legacy charges. Some of those charges have now been in, in the ground for 10 years and, and may not have had the right maintenance contracts and, and not maintained. There is the gap in terms of data. So we have 70% live data. That's brilliant. There is still 30% of charge points where we can't see what that availability is. So that that does give people, people anxiety. And then I think the third thing is all around the fact that there are certainly pinch points on the network at the moment. So uh, you, you hear stories in, in the um, in the holidays, maybe people going down the M5 and saying they're queuing. So in some areas, there are still not enough uh, rapid chargers or ultra rapid chargers there. And I think the answer there is, as Alex is saying, ultra rapid chargers, installing them in hubs. When we look at where are the charge points that are used the most, because we can see all the utilization data within in ZapMap, you can see that actually those hubs are where most people are attracted to and most people are going. And I think the good news is that they are being rolled out and there are many, many applications for planning permission and, and there's lots of people who are wanting to install them. So this this issue will go away, but we need to keep on installing more. You know, it's, it's not a it's not an install a few and it's done. We've, we've, we've got to keep on installing until 2030 and beyond. And that's a great opportunity, I think. Excellent, yeah, nice to talk about the opportunity at the end of our uh, discussion of challenges, if you like. As you said, major transition, mindset shift, data, data gaps, data quality is key uh, to smoother progress. And a nice point about the hubs and the ongoing and real appetite and demand for more, because obviously it's it's a growth scenario that we're looking to push here. But uh, so last, no means least, I'm afraid, Darren, I'm going to ask you the question about cost, you know, that four-letter word. So where's the money going to come from to help the likes of building owners and housing providers tackle challenges of affordability and accessibility? And is the funding available to make it a level playing field? I think I've asked you this kind of question before at times. So EV charging doesn't end up a story of haves and have nots. So it's not just about the money, but who's going to get the money, Darren? So that's (laughs) quite a loaded question um, in places. Uh, So... What we've been doing in government is basically stimulating the market. Um, when you start off, obviously any market will have early adopters who typically will be the house because they're buying the brand new cars. I've never bought a brand new car. Uh, so the market's going to develop for electric vehicles. We already see the second hand market taking off. And as the years go by and those decent second hand, third hand, fourth hand electric vehicles trickle down, then People who post 2030, so you got 50, people who buy 15 year old vehicles now in 15 years' time may still be buying 15 year old vehicles, which is the electric vehicles and petrol. Uh, so it, it, that's why I'm saying it's a bit of a loaded question of haves and have nots. What we're doing with grants is trying to stimulate the market so that actually people know how to get the charge point mm-hmm. to. So we're fairly confident that if you're a homeowner with an off-street parking, it's easy. Lots of options for how you can do it. Lots of installation companies who can do it. And big players coming in, so they should be competing in price fairly soon. Um, mature market, that's why we stepped away. A really good to see a question from a housing association. This is an example of where we don't think the market is that mature. So we've changed the grants that we offer in April, to actually support housing associations, uh, put in charge points, looking at people who are in flats and mm-hmm. or rent, because these are the challenging areas. They need permission yeah. from somebody else. The landowner needs to kind of work out, how do I do this? Why do I do this? Exactly the point that Shamala raised about how do we coordinate and plan out to 2030, how we're going to do this as an organization. So. The demand is there. I think the question from uh, Louise Beard, so it shows the demand is there from people who live in housing, in social housing. Mm -hmm. But 
that thinking about how do we do this? How does the market provide? Isn't there? So that's why we're, we're focusing on the grants to try and stimulate the market so that actually at some point in the future, um, we can step back because actually housing associations know how to do it. They kind of have planned out how to do it. Um, and this is kind of where our plan is, where our money will go in the areas where basically they need help or a little stimulation so they can work out how to help themselves. Excellent. So nice answer. And a good point about as you move from, you know, the, uh, the early adopters who are in first to the second hand market and effectively mass market take up. Um, you're stimulating the market with money, but also um, with education and information and legislation where we need to as well um, so the building regulations is an example of actually we didn't think that the building people building new properties were moving at the speed we wanted to so we legislated to uh, accelerate that provision yeah that's a, that's a nice uh, so a nice carrot and stick kind of scenario there here's some money and here's some encouragement also to do something in a legislative and regulatory fashion i wonder if perhaps uh, we could pick up the question from Peter Bullock here then, uh, Darren, he, he's asking, are the existing apartment block infrastructure grants likely to extend into the next financial year, or could this be an example of support winding down? Would that be something you could it's, offer? It comment? will go into the next financial year, unless um, something drastic happens with government finances. But under the last spending review, we have finances to go into the next financial year. Excellent. And a positive answer. Good stuff. Right. And that takes me nicely into we're already picked up some questions. Uh, there's some more to come. Do pop them in the box. Ask a question at the bottom and we'll get to them in a free for all session at the end. So last round from me, we've looked at the difficult stuff, the, the tricky stuff, the negative, the challenges, the bumps in the road. Last bit, a quick round the panel. This is called Positives and Hopes. It's reasons to be cheerful. I really enjoy your reference for you there. So look at successful, sustainable approaches to managing the rollout, how it's going to help us get that charging infrastructure, decarbonise transport, save money on fuel, create green jobs, get us near net zero goals. It's going to be utopian. <laughs> it's going to do I know, exactly. I'd, I'd sign up for that and vote for that. Great stuff. So first, rose-tinted spectacles on then. Alex, your business in an emerging sector, as you described earlier, growth potential, painters, a dynamic picture of that market opportunity and what can you hope to do in this space as things move forward? Yeah, so I, I think it's an emerging technology and um, we have a mantra around uh, being ethically responsible and, and delivering a, a customer-centric service. So we're always striving to look for the latest and greatest technology advancements, the latest and greatest roaming opportunities to furthering the opportunity for customers to experience a you know uh, the best the best possible uh, charging experience so the development of auto charge or iso 15118 so that you can just plug and charge um linking in with as many different um charge point operators as we can in the uk to have that seamless experience um technologies like the ones being developed at ZapMap by, by Melanie and her team, we've just gone on to ZapPay, um, so that there's an opportunity for an aggregator platform to bring together a number of CPOs, so you don't have to have 15, 20 RFID cards and apps in your phone. Um, we're looking to, to focus on listening to the publics, listening to where charges need to go. I think Shamala was talking about that as well, making sure that you've got the right charging infrastructure in the right location. Um, one of the areas that we are looking to uh, push commercial landowners into is to is to not deploy too many uh, charges, uh, but get the, the balance right. Mm -hmm. What we don't want is stranded assets, which is a carbon footprint own goal, really. Um, we're looking to get the right number of charges, the right speed of service, um, but also to you know, popularize locations uh, by bringing the footfall of, of, of EV drivers to those locations with the right type of charging infrastructure to, to promote the um, flourishment of the environment where the, where the charges are. Um, so there's a number of different types of locations. I think we, we talked about uh, the, the, the behaviors uh, and the changing landscape and consumers getting their head around uh, that you don't just have to go to one specific location to refuel. You can top up here, you can fully refuel there, you can do most of your charging overnight. So there's gonna be a revolutionized landscape of different charging technologies that suit 
multiple different purposes. Um, but I think the utopia that we're looking towards is uh, working towards greater renewable energy generation locally um, and maybe introducing time of use tariffs so that on a sunny day we can drive and generate more people to charge at a specific time for a cheaper rate um, and bringing in these real time dynamic opportunities to maximize our sustainability opportunity. Um, and I think that's where we really need to get to. Our panel is a, uh, the biggest renewables generator in Europe, and it, we're, we're looking to provide a network that can distribute genuinely renewable energy. And I think that is where we ought to be striving towards. It's not about just deploying the technology. It's around ethical responsibility, getting the right technology, the right customer service, um, making sure that it's reliable, it works, it's a, it's a brilliant experience, and that it's truly sustainable. Um, and that's across fleets as well as uh, you know passenger vehicles, and that is where we should be headed, and that's certainly where we're Excellent. headed. Exciting opportunity, as you say, and you do very much describe a maturing market. Uh, nice point about need for balance, uh, not just um, a wild dash for growth, you know, that results in stranded assets, and seeing it um, in joined up thinking in terms of the centralised and distributed energy and clean and green energy. It's all part of a bigger sustainability picture, no less. So sounds utopian then. So Darren, so with, with that same rose tint of view then, 2030 ban on sales of new fossil fuels cars looming large. Describe for us how you think the landscape perhaps literally will change for EVs and charging before the end of the decade. Paint us a little picture, please, Darren. I think Alex touched on it. So the first thing is that um, the ban is not just something in isolation, it's the whole decarbonisation strategy. And this includes the decarbonisation of energy, which I think given where we are, the current stage of gas prices and that knock-on effect of electricity prices, it will be interesting to follow how that actually affects the long, medium to long-term price of electricity and charging. Does it actually become very different to how it is today? Mm -hmm. There's quite a few unknowns as we... Uh, move to 2030 and exactly how people will be thinking there will be a lot more evs on the road come 2030 second hand and new so that actually people may be starting to thinking about the phasing out of petrol and diesel there may be calm fueling pressures on those vehicles um i expect the world to be a bit quieter a bit cleaner um uh, and it will be looking at plans in place will be for phasing out um, the heavy goods vehicles, the motorbikes. It, we're not just phasing out cars. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's still a lot of things that will be going on, but I, I expect it to be quite a different world. Yeah, nice. A nice point you make about the... There are unknowns and we, we should be honest about the fact that it is evolving. Um, and I guess there's well, a lot of talk at present about companies being agile and having an agile man's mindset to respond to changing market conditions, including shocks. But of course, there's maybe an onus on uh, government in terms of funding also to be agile and responsive in terms of exactly how we get where we want to be by 2030 because there are some unknowns and there are some gaps in the map if you like and things will change as we progress so nice point there so uh, Shamala if I come to you then so pump price is spiking sell us the vision for Coventry building integrated EV as part of the solution to that problem that we're all very aware of so uh, give us the uh, the come to Coventry speech no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, uh, that's a that's a, that's a tall uh, uh, order there. <laughs> but, but see, as a local authority, I think it is very important that we are inclusive. So we not just look at integration of EV charging infrastructure. It is yeah. as a, again as a local authority, but as a highway authority, we are also looking to make sure that there are changes, behavior changes made. So one of the things uh, is to reduce car ownership. So looking at providing things like electric car clubs, 
uh, multimodal hub. So every like 10 minute walking distance, you create this small uh, micro mobility hubs, you know, where you can, uh, you have a choice of different uh, modes of clean modes of travel. Uh, Coventry is going to be all electric bus city by end of 2025. <clears throat> so public transport already will exist as part of a, a, a green uh, um, sort of tra transport. And we are also pioneering the very light rail, again, a mass, uh, an, an urban mass transit um, solution. So if you provide, so the, the, who is the target audience? And I'm only talking about Coventry here. Uh, I think you could look at then uh, scaling that up. Um, but in Coventry, uh, we are looking at targeting the second, third, fourth vehicles in a household. So it is basically saying, you know, don't have, don't, don't, don't own that many vehicles. Uh, here is a set of um, solutions for you to uh, use as an alternative mode of transport. So look at that, look at sustainable way of um, this, like uh, uh, what, what Alex just said, it's about uh, making sure that you don't put that strain on the grid as well. So we have a um, sort of delivered a project uh, for uh, under the ULEB, which is ultra low emission bus project, where we partnered with National Express, purchased 10 electric buses, but then we went and installed solar panels on the depot roof. Now those solar panels generate and, and have a battery storage. They generate enough uh, uh, power to provide um, uh, uh, energy for these 10 buses throughout the year. You know, looking at solutions like that. So we are also looking at solar farms and looking to create this sustainable way of managing um, public transport and also generating uh, local energy to provide for public charging uh, wherever possible, really. So it's it's looking at a green city, um, active travel, all of that. You know, it's, it's a behavior change. So there is a lot going on. Um, and uh, all the different departments are working, uh, I would say, for the first time together, you know, instead of just doing their own thing. So that is quite a nice thing to see. Yeah, that's very positive. Great. And it's, of course, interesting. <clears throat> it's easy to see this as it's about tech or energy or transport. But as you said, it's about behavior change to a yeah. great extent, you know, which is um, a much more complicated equation to do potentially. And it's uh, nice to think that if Monday Lady Godiva does appear then if she's not on the electric bus she'll have somewhere to charge her ev so there's an image for us so um <clears throat> last then but we'll have about 10 minutes of questions from the audience <clears throat> last before that though a bit of future gazing for you melanie fast forward maybe five or ten years so what might success it's all gone well it's all gone beautifully so what would success <laughs> look like and why wouldn't it exactly and there's, it? <laughs> there's, there's, there's no there's no doubt in my voice whatsoever it will it will go that well so what is success going to look like for this charge point rollout, Melanie? Oh, brilliant. Well, I, I love Jamala's vision of Coventry, and I'm definitely going to come there because I think that is brilliant. We're all about this multimodal transport, but focusing on electric cars and and, uh, uh, and charging. So by 2030, um, according to most forecasts, we will have 10 million electric cars on the UK roads out of 30, around 30 million cars. So that's, you know, one in three cars will, will have a plug. So we'll have a very different world. So first of all, at, at home of those 60% or so of people who are lucky enough to be able to charge at home, I see electric cars very much as a gateway drug to all sorts of other technologies. So I see people having home charging, linking it to the solar panel, linking it to the ground source heat pump, having battery storage and really starting to have that real energy system working with the electric car at the core and, you know, and charging off peak in terms of actually helping back rebalance the grid. So I think that's that's a really important thing. In terms of those who don't have off-street parking, I see them sharing, having a lot of community charging, sharing charging with those, those who do. I see there being rollout of on-street chargers across most major cities and local, char local charging hub, hubs put in place. Then on route charging, I see beautiful all-purpose um, on a, a sort of uh, ultra ultra rapid charging hubs with different facilities for people to do whether that's working or or uh, things for the children or retail 
uh, uh, payment won't be a, will not be an issue because, uh, as Alex said, there will be a single single way to pay, whether that's plug and charge or sort of through, through various aggregated aggregated systems. So I see a really really positive a positive future for, for charging across the UK. And also, I think as you you drive up to a, one of your ultra rapid hubs, you'll get a get a message on your phone saying, "Would you like?" Uh, if you, if you charge on my network, you might get a free coffee and then someone else give you an offer to do something else. So there's all sorts of exciting things that, that will happen uh, well, once once we get to, to, to 2030. Exactly. Nice, nice descriptions there. So when we're at one in three and uh, you have providers competing for your business with uh, <laughs> the promise of free coffee. So it's, it's going to be uh, it's going to be gravy all the way. So, um, right. We're going. Thank you very much then. So we're going to open it up to live Q&A from the Floor, you pose them, I'll ask them, Darren Shamala, Melanie and Alex and answer them. So we've got a couple more already in the box down there. The first one, I think, if I just throw it uh, from Stephen Saxton. Melanie, if I throw it quickly to you, because he's asking, open source debt, what data is there to allow gap analysis of supply versus demand? How do potential EV owners go about checking local infrastructure prior to purchasing? Yes, so... Set, so on, on, on the open source data, there is there is data uh, available. You can go to Open Charge Map to download open source data, or the Charge Point Registry is still available. And um, ZapMap also has a um, commercial data license for people who want to do data analysis at a sort of company cool. level. I mean, in terms of the second point, how do how do individuals who want to get an electric car go and check out the charging point infrastructure near them? Download ZapMap, put put in you know put in location here and then you'll see what what's near you and you can filter by all sorts of different you can put in your ev and filter and find what charge points are are good for you and and or compatible with your your chosen car etc excellent thank you and there's another question here which i think i'll run around a few of the panelists come from unnamed it seems but it's uh could the panel talk about what building tenants businesses particularly can do to encourage their landlords to install ev charges does it complicate things in terms of responsibility? So I wonder if I could run that first from Darren, then Shamla. So Darren, how easily can they get the information to prompt, encourage, to put it on a plate for their landlord potentially and, and get that kind of provision where they need it if you're a tenant? So we do recognise that this is an, a challenging area and um, it can be complicated further by leasehold agreements um, of what the tenant can or cannot do. Um, if you're going to your landlord, um, there are things which make it an incentive for them to actually do stuff for um, tenants, for their business tenants. So we reformed our grants, so there's money available for commercial landlords to put in charge points for their tenants, staff or fleet use. So there's money there, first off. There's also, they may be able to claim back the cost by capital allowances or and even super deduction. So financially, it need not be a barrier. They just need to think a little bit about it. Um, and then kind of the long term information, the sell side is it's great for keeping tenants yep. and reducing vacancy rates. This is true for commercial and residential landlords. Um, so leasehold complexities aside um there are sell sides that you can go to your landlord with excellent so nice couple of points i'm going to i'll just give you a heads up alex i'll come to you last perhaps wearing your mayor hat about um uh, what are the principal i'd like to give me maybe the top three incentives or reasons why building owners should be investing and should be taking the plunge. So I'll give you a moment to think about top three reasons if you had to give us your elevator pitch. That's a horrible question for you to finish with. I'm gonna buy you a few minutes of time though, because we've got about five minutes left or less. Shamala, quick from you. If they're wanting to prompt, same question, if they're wanting to prompt their uh, landlords, etc., to do the right thing, it might be different in their local area. How easy is it for them to talk to their council and get some help and get some information so that between them uh, they can progress things? Shall you we? know, I'm, I'm, it's not that easy. Um, I have had a couple of tenants contact me, basically saying that they would like a charge point. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the tenants said they have got a charge point, but it doesn't work. Uh, so can the council help? <coughs> Not really, because it is private land. Mm -hmm. It's a private tenant. 
it's a private landlord. So as an authority, we have no say in what that landlord does. Are there any incentives that the local authority can provide? Not really, because they don't, uh, other than council tax, you know, there is nothing that they uh, pay to the authority. So there is nothing that the authority can say, well, look, we will help you with your business rates or things yeah, like yeah, that, okay. work like that with the tenancy. So I have found that it was not that easy to provide that help other than if the landlord comes to us and asks, then we do point them to OZEV uh, okay. website because there are uh, vouchers and, and help available financially. Um, I think 75% okay. of the cost or, 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 or a voucher scheme. Okay. So other than that, uh -huh. from an authority perspective, not really. Uh, it does become a bit challenging other than what we can provide on street for them. Okay, that, that's great. That's a, that's a good uh, frank answer as well. It is very much coming down to more to the private sector and to commercial decisions. And maybe that, as we're just about to wind up, brings me nicely then to Alex. So if if you do then have to sell it with the three big reasons why building of landowners should be making the decisions, uh, what would they be? Give us give us the elevator pitch then, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK. Um... I'm going to take it from the perspective of a commercial landowner because that's my, my best yep. perspective and, and then I can categorise it so that it doesn't get too diverse. <clears throat> so I think the first one is, we touched on it right at the very intro, if you look at SMMT data, 15% uh, of all new vehicles last month were full battery electric vehicles. The transition is happening right now and it's exploding. And it's only 15% because of the lack of availability of vehicles, yep. because there's restrictions on manufacturing. It would be a great deal higher. If you look at the order book, it is ridiculous by comparison. So I think some people are pushing it into the distance and saying the market's not ready yet. <clears throat> That's one. If you then take into consideration the length of time that it takes to energize um, a, a hub, for, for example, if we're looking at a high voltage connection with all of the legal and panel restrictions, availability of hardware, time that it takes to do the construction piece you're probably looking at 12 to 18 months from now from concept to energization so bearing in mind the market's exploding today a year and a, in a year and a half's time if you haven't started yet it yeah. will be buoyant um looking at that you've also got to give consideration there is not an infinite supply of power have a look at what's available around you today do that good investigation work and put at least the bare minimum of what's available to you in place to start establishing those behaviors of attracting EV drivers to your location and setting that pattern. And I think then, you know, I've touched on it already. The other one is um, you're missing out on an opportunity for income stream if you don't do that. Not only for you, in terms of a charge point operator will pay you a strong commercial offer because it's a competitive landscape to develop on your landscape to provide this infrastructure. Um, but also, you know, there's an incidental spend for the tenants that you have on site and generating footfall to rejuvenate retail spend. So those are the, probably the top three. It's happening, it's happening now. Re really nice summary to close then. So the trend is happening. Time is not necessarily your friend. Start now because it's already later than you think. And the last, I guess, is just FOMO, fear of missing out because it is an opportunity and it's one you're going to miss out on commercially if you don't seize it. So good notes to end on then. Closing, thank you to all our panellists, Darren, Shamla, Melanie, and of course, Alex and our sponsors at Mayor. To yourselves, our virtual audience out there on Crowdcast, comments and questions, reminder to check out Elemental, elementalexpo.com, online community for professionals focused on innovation, heat, water, air, and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now in the future. Full diary events on the website, back catalogue as well. That's it for today. Join me again tomorrow at 2 p.m. for the next instalment in the EV's Digital Festival. I've been Jim McClellan. Thanks again to the panel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.